okay, when we're teaching, are we really teaching the things that kids need at the start of the process? Or are we just teaching the things we want to teach them? So is our perception of tennis correct at this early stage? Or um, have we sort of fallen into the trap of thinking we know about tennis but we don't necessarily understand where a kid is at at each, at each point? So we are going to follow through the, the handout that I've put um, in the book or wherever you've got it. So it's He's too good, isn't he? He's too good. Okay, so let's just go a little bit of a revision from this morning. This is the way I, I physically explain those three learning principles. Remember, I said. In order for make to, some, to make something happen, yeah, you have to have. Does anyone remember what the three things were? Motivation. Motivation. No, so they were the, the three things on the instructional slide. Remember what we said we talked about this afternoon. First one was motivation. Opportunity. Opportunity. Good. Capacity. Capacity. So the kid must want to do it. The environment must allow them to do it, and they must be physically and mentally able to do it get those three things, very often they learn quickly. All right? If you're missing one of those three things, it often looks like this. Yeah? So it often looks like you're trying to do this. Which, as a coach, it's not impossible, but it can be really frustrating. Oh, there we go. Nice. We got it, okay? But then you only need the slightest you know, little bit of interference or problem or anything else and you know the whole thing's gonna fall apart. So we've had that experience as a coach. You've taught something, it's been frustrating to get it done. You finally get it done, you think, yeah, but then they come back next week and it's all under. It's because one of those things wasn't quite right. Yeah? Either they weren't motivated to carry on working at it. Like the first tennis lesson I ever took was from a, a guy in his 70s, so I was 13 or 14. He was in his 70s, his name was John Hancock, he played at Wimbledon. He was a legend and he smoked a pipe <laughs> while he taught. <laughs> right. uh, so, hit some balls, and after about 20 minutes, he went, Okay, old chap, I'm four, 13 or 14, I'm thinking, old chap, how does that work? Right. Just hit the ball a little bit more out in front. That's it, he never said anything else the rest of the lesson. Okay? But actually, what did I get from the lesson? No, no, what did I get from the lesson? Think about it. Hit the ball out in front. It's the only message he gave me. So guess what? I went away, I was highly motivated, I went away and practiced. What did I do for the next week against the ball of the house? Hit the ball in front, come back next week. I did hit the ball more out in front. So the reality is sometimes we think more is better. It's not. You just need a motivated learner yeah, and concise information. So that's a good example of, you know, how because I was motivated, he gave me a very simple piece of information. And I really did something with it. And then opportunity, capacity, remember, opportunity is the environment. We're going to look at that, some of the pros and cons of what we think about. And capacity is um, the kid, the Bart Simpson thing. But also we have to look a little bit at um, cognitive capacity. How does a child see the world? Now, the very interesting thing about tennis is tennis involves a number of different pieces of the environment. So you've got the core, you've got the ball, you've got the opponent. You've got all those things going on, and the tennis is a blend of those things. Sometimes, some kids, because of their nature at certain ages, don't think about all those factors. Good example. Have you ever had a kid who almost sees and seems annoyed when the other kid hits the ball back over the net. Yeah? Because, as far as he's concerned, the other kid sh doesn't exist almost. It's like they're just an annoying problem in the environment. It's not until a kid is generally about seven or eight that they can, for example, link shots together to achieve a plan. Most eight, nine-year-olds, that's the first age for eight, nine-year-olds, 
where they actually would recognise who they're playing, how that player thinks and how that player wants to play. If a 15 year old doesn't recognise their opponent is left handed, we have a problem. Right? But if a 6 year old doesn't recognise their opponent is left handed, that's totally natural. They're not thinking about anything else. Do you notice how some little kids cry when they lose? Normally boys cry more than girls when they lose. Yeah? Two reasons. One, they think everything should be under their control. They think if they lost, it's because they did something wrong. Okay? The second thing is the message for boys is always, you're supposed to be the alpha, you're supposed to win, you're supposed to... Little girls don't get that message quite so much. And when they do get that message and take that role, people don't like them. <laughs> Serena's a great example, isn't it? Yeah? Serena's like Vegemite. <laughs> you love her or you hate her. If you really understand it, right, you love her because she's a, one of the, the, the premium athlete in the world. If you don't understand it, you don't like the image of an aggressive woman. Right? So little boys and little girls have got that right at the start. And that's part of their makeup, how they think tactically and all those kind of things. Right? That's for us to think about with capacity. All right, um, but what I want to start by doing really is, is um, you start to look at the concept of skill. So when we're teaching, we're teaching a skill. Now, what's the difference between skill and technique? Because generally, coaches use the two interchangeably. But they are, if you look at the definition, they are actually different. Anyone know? Let's do a little, okay, um, talk to the person next year, 30 seconds, see if you can work it out. What's the difference between skill and technique? You only have to contribute your answer if you think you might have got it. Right? You're feeling stupid, that's fine. Alright? Okay, difference between skill and technique. Yeah, sounds right. Technique is like steps. So if you're standing just looking at technique, you're struggling right now. But if you understand that skill has an outcome, your opponent was standing over there. Yeah, it could be when they're standing over there, or actually, if I want to go there, oh. I need to warm up properly. I should have been on hit with those two guys before. Really. <laughs> Execute. Why not hit like this? 
the other one to hit like this. And if Roger Federer wants to hit the ball that far, he's going to hit it like that. He's not going to go, oh, my coach said I have to do a follow through. And add that to the end. So the, the, the concept of teaching a skill is, is a little bit different, but it's also vitally important for us because skill has context, and context creates motivation. The reason that what the reason you're learning something is more important than what you're learning. Why is more important than what? Okay. So if that was the concept by which we start, why is more important than what? And I've got these kids and they've not played tennis before. How can I get them to understand the game of tennis? All right. And that's so. I might start. By the way, all the things we're going to do today, right? I'm going to, uh, there's not going to be uh, step one, step two, step three, because that also is a false premise for learning. There's going to be step one, two, three, four, five, six, all at once. In other words, it's not steps at all. It's different things. Learning isn't about taking this step one, step two, step three approach. Learning is about all the defined things that you have to try and develop and have it and approaching it from all different sides. Okay, so before you start what, which one comes before the other, what I'm going to say to you is we're going to do some reception skills. We're going to do some projection skills. We're going to do some skills that involve learning about the game. Which ones do I do in the lesson? All of them. Alright? All of them. And we and it's this human need to put things in very neat boxes which sometimes causes us a problem. Mm -hmm. All right, because no, boxes are nice and easy to follow, but actually we need to approach things from all different sides. So I'm going to create the motivation to start with. I need like, can I get four people to come and play? Yeah, just come out for long. You know what tennis coaches sat down are like polar bears in the jungle. <laughs> you can basically survive, but that's about it. You know, you're not active. And I believe tennis coaches, the tennis coaches brain is connected to their butt. As soon as that hits the deck, it starts to switch off. Right, one, two, three, four. Right, we four. Okay, so give me a really, let's let's move beyond the real, I would actually start beyond the first tactic of tennis and go to the second one. Because we don't believe that the, the first tactic of tennis is actually a tactic. First tactic of tennis is what, most time? Get the ball in. Most people say get the ball in. Well, get the ball in, we can do better than that. Right, so what we want to learn is we want to learn about the game of tennis. So we're going to have, I've got your name. Ilan. Ilan, you go the other end. Marley, you go this end. We're going to start on, the, we're going to have the 27 foot line here. Okay, Brett, you go down the other end. And Brett, you go here. All right, so first of all, I want them to learn about the game. All right, so we're going to start this whole game with throwing and catching. Right, at the end of it, I'm going to ask them, what do I need to be able to do to win the game? Okay. So, let's say we're going to say, you have to throw the ball cross the ball. Then you're going to start with behind the line. So you always do behind the line. Uh, you're going to throw the ball over the net, and then you have to work out how to win the game. Right, so you're going to play a point, take turns to serve. All right, so it's not formal, it's fairly relaxed and away we go. We can find the spaces. Okay, go. <coughs> So if we broke it down from there, we'd say, right, well, what are the skills we now need 
in order to get to this point with rackets. Right, and that's what we that's where we can start. We can drill it right down to technique if we want to. Or, and we can start to also look at all the other things. But for me, that would be the best tennis to start with. Now most people would start like that. But that's actually what the game of tennis is about. We start with the little kids. Yeah? So um, we could say, right, um, how did you win or lose a point? Okay, you change okay, you change the direction. Uh, the depth right Okay, we change the speed, right? Just distance, good, yeah. Direction. Huh? Okay, direction. Right. You could some eventually the kid will go, well, I missed. If you missed, you lost the point. So if you wanted to get back to tactic number one. That's where you'd be going. You'd be going, well, okay, well, missed, I mean, if we can get it over more, we can make it work. All right? So that's, that's really important that we start with that kind of point. And if you looked at your, at your skill, so if you move down this thing, because I like to, um, we're, we're on like, what is skill, right? The second bit down, and it says, okay, first of all, you have to define what the intention and the mission is. The mission is to get more past the person, to make it go over more times than them, to find the spaces however you want to define that. That's the mission. The fact that we haven't got, that we have or we haven't got a racket is not really vital. Does the underrate answer that question or you tell them? No, well, we try and ask them as much as possible. Um, okay, so there, there are, I'm not, going to tell you, I'm not going to tell you that every kid will answer it brilliantly, right? I'm going to tell you this. There are different levels of intervention. So further down the page towards the bottom, you see we have these different levels of intervention. And this is where we get into real coaching stuff. If you work with a really good player who is really able, I never use talented, I'll say able. Talented just makes kids work less and parents expect more, right? So I just say, okay, I never use the word talented. I had a parent who had a dinner party. Every single time a kid won a tournament or was told something nice, she'd have a dinner party just so she could tell all the other parents how good her kid was. The dad would come in every week and go, okay, what's up, John? She did it again, Mike. Got back last Thursday night. She said six friends come around halfway through. She said, the county said, my Johnny's talented. Man. <laughs> yeah, right. So parents create this, it creates those peacocks we were talking about before, yeah? So never use that, but able, able kid will learn from their environment. I, I laugh sometimes at some of the concepts of you know, people, the high performance coach who says, this is my player, and you look at the player and you go, yeah, that kid could have been taught by like an Eskimo and he would still have been a legend, <laughs> right? Who knew about shark fishing and nothing else. You know, but the coach is still going around. Yeah, we know that kid learn by himself. They learn in spite of you, not because of you, right? The next, so that's a, so the next level is you could change the environment. If we wanted you to really learn a lot more about, say for example, ask the question, Paul, and they go, I don't know. Yeah, we could change the environment. So we could change the environment by saying, right, um, we're a bit short of throwing a light up with Okay, I'm going to make the court like a real wide, but short court like this. And that highlights the side spaces of the court. And then I go, Okay, um, right, play again. And then they might go, oh yeah, I'm moving from side to side. Okay, so we could do that. We could ask questions. Now, obviously, with younger kids, you ask multiple choice questions. Is it A or is it B? With older kids, they should be out of art and develop to deliver something a bit more expansive than that. But there will be some kids who I call them the Homer Simpson kid, <laughs> right? You've changed the environment, you've modified everything. You've given them different stimulus, you ask questions and you still get to the point that he still goes, I don't know. And now at that point, you just have to tell them. So a lot of people get down there, you know, oh, do we use guided discovery? Or do we use directed style coaching? Do I do the modified environment? Or let's modify the environment all the time. That's fine if you've got good kids. Yeah? But sometimes you're just going to have to understand you have a range of interventions. That, and to be honest, if I was a beginner coach, I'd start with a direct approach, tell the answer, and I'd learn to ask questions. Yeah? Then I'd learn to create physical stimulus, 
then I've learned to modify the environment. Just to, to arrive at a teaching point by modifying the environment every time is like Obi-Wan Kenobi style coach. If you're really good, you can do it, but not everyone can do it yet. Okay? So, so on this, I could ask the question, I might have to ask the question, open, Marley, how did you win? And she go, I moved them around, I did this, I did this. I go, okay, how did you win, Marley? Did you uh, throw the ball deep all the time, or did you try and move them from side to side? It's a different style of question, it depends. All right, anybody, anything else? No, okay, so what I'm saying is, it doesn't matter what level you're working with, if you want to introduce the game tactically, even if it's a very advanced tactic, get rid of this thing, just playing for a few minutes like this, can help them to understand what it is that they need to do. And now we have, when you understand why you need to do it, now we have a motivated learner. All right, so that's quite important that we drill it down to that. Then we start to get into, yeah, if you like, what are, what, how do we set up any environment? Now, this we can do really quickly get these basics out of the way, then we can do a lot more activities. The environment's set up based on uh, three things. The, what the skills are already highlighted, but the environment's always set up by, have you decided the space in which the activity is supposed to happen? Most people will put a kid out on a red court, is a really good example. Um, we need a racket, so. This is a bit of a this is a bit of a problem that came out. When these balls and rackets came out, everybody said, "Oh look, it's really easy. You just put the kids out to play, and they'll learn to play all by themselves." Yeah, right. Yeah. No. That's not not if you want them. Yeah. Okay. No, that's not true. If you want to play like this. Trapping, catching in a cone, 
receiving, calling out where it's going to land. Whenever a ball is sent, there should be someone there working on receiving. Remember, receiving is harder than sending in tennis. In every club, there's somebody who plays there with backhand like this. Yeah? They didn't choose to play like that. They didn't go, you know what? I've seen Federer, I've seen Serena. Well, this is going to rock it, I think. I'm going with this one. <laughs> All right? What happened is they were in the wrong place at the wrong time, loads and loads and loads of times. So this became their technique. Normally, it's because they didn't prepare or do anything. They're suddenly like, oh! Yeah? And before you know it, this becomes their backhand. So, reception is really important. So, whenever we send a ball, if we haven't worked on reception, that's important. But also, the other thing is, if I don't understand, there's a person down the other end, and the ball might come back. Yeah? Then I'm not really understanding what tennis is. I need to get that the ball could come back. It's a really important thing. I need to understand tennis, I will have an opponent. So, sending and receiving, it's really important, that means two players. The other, the other little incidental that gets missed all the time is we don't do enough movement. So again, even on this drill, a classic would be, you know, you put the basket right next to the player. Why is the basket right next to the player? They're definitely not going to move. If they have to do to get the next ball, we can do that. Put the basket over there. Now, every time I hit the serve, I'll go on that kick. Even if I've got Marley age four, and she has to hit a thing over the net all day, right? and mum's been the monkey in the cage on the balcony, right? <laughs> Stressing, right? And so I decide, you know what? I'm gonna let Marley play golf. Right, this is playing golf. Right, Marley, here you go. Ready? Bounce and hit. Oh, you're good for four. All right, okay. All right. Rather than start her there, I'm just going to do this. Right, oh, you come here. Hey, stop. Back and back. And go. And back you go to the middle. And I'm just going to add some recovery. So in everything you do, we're trying to make sure those three things are in every drill. Here's a contentious one, though. Does that mean I can't feed from the basket? Let's deal with this basket thing a little bit. We got, um, can you grab a racket? Have we got any other rackets we can grab? So you can grab one. We can bring a couple of those out there if you like, you know, just chill out. Working on moving. Yeah. I, I, so the argument there is, actually, yes, I, if I want to work on movement, I can't give a lot of feedback still. If I was doing cardio tennis, why not? Nothing wrong with that. Okay, so this idea that we can't ever feed out the basket is a little bit interesting. It depends what we're trying to achieve. If I want to give technical feedback, no, of course I can't. 
If I want to fit, but what is there anything wrong with this? Right, you two guys just try this hat on there. So the gal the gal over there. Okay, can you guys work on cross four forehand? Right? Every time you step over the baseline, you're gonna stop the rally. Let's see how long you can do. So start behind with a red there. Okay, you go the other end for me and I've got in here. Step over the baseline, that's where the rally is. Okay, right. Um, I'll leave it here, and then the recovery, hit the recovery, hit the three balls. So every time you spin over the cover, right, I'm going to try to get a little deep in the final four. Let's go. Right, okay, that's what I'm going to do. Okay, let's try that again. Right, let's try that again. Right, let's try that again. The scary part is a lot of parents want to see hit a ball, run and touch the net and slide back. So we've got to do a very good job educating because the parents think that's a good lesson. I mean, the thing about parents is, very interesting thing about parents is, you want parents close. I don't want parents up there in that window. I about, want them there. What about so bringing them on the court? Huh? What about bringing them on the court? Yeah, about well, that's what I mean. I actually want them really close to the court. In fact, the worse they are, the closer I want them. And I'm going to do two things. One is I'm going to do this. I'm going to go, that Marley's going to be here. And I'm going to go, uh, that's really good, Marley. You adjusted really well that time to get in the right position for that ball. I go, what? What the hell? I'm not talking to her. I'm talking to her dad, who's over there. <laughs> All right? Making sure he knows what's going on. The other thing is, every once in a while, when I've got something active going on, I'm going to flow over here and I'm going to go. Yeah, you know, some parents, they don't understand how important it is to get in the right position. But I'm glad you do. <laughs> yeah? I'm really glad you do. Because sometimes I have so much problem with those parents that don't get it. Right? It's so good that you get it. Anyway, right, carry on. All right, and then I'm going to go back. <laughs> All right? So I'm always going to make sure that I remember there are two customers, that these people are paying, that these people are my best salespeople. That if I have a relationship with my parents, they're going to bring me more people. If I have a bad relationship with my parent, they're listening to the peacock up behind the glass. Right? So it's, it's going to be a thing always with parents. What about the parent who is sitting up here? The child is engaged, somewhat bashful, and he's telling her what she needs to do. Okay, all right. It's really
really good. So the question is, it, what about parents who are getting over-involved? Whenever the parent joins the club, coaching, what we do is we have a piece of paper, and at the top it says coach, parent, we give it to the coach, or the parent rather, we say go away and write down all the jobs of each person on either side. Write down all of your jobs and write down all the coach's jobs because that will balance our expectation. All right? And then nowhere do they ever put down on that side, my job is to teach my kid. So now, remember I said you put it on paper, now you've got something you can come back and you can go, you know what, we agreed on that piece of paper at the start of this, that my job was to do the coaching and your job was to get them to the right place on time, feed them, be positive with your comments, you know, because they'll write down all the things. Once they start writing their list, there's a lot of things on their list. A lot more than on the coaching list. Then you have something to come back to. But you have to define the boundaries, and most coaches don't define the boundaries because they're worried about losing the customer. If you've got a customer who's overstepping the boundaries and causing problems, the stress is going to kill your business alone. Just define the boundaries right from the start. Mike, what about the young kids, girls or boys that are, let's say, 46 years old? They tend to be really distracted if they can handle clothes physically. In other words, it almost sounds like a three-day communication. Yeah, it has to be. I want, I want the communication to be between me and the, and the kid, not that the kid is waiting at the dad every three minutes or a distraction. Okay, I don't say that I want the parents on there every time. In fact, one of my, I have a little thing that's like charts of a parent, and one of them says, if you watch every lesson your kid ever takes, you need to get a life. <laughs> <laughs> right? If you can, you know, don't carry their bag, their legs need the exercise. It's got all little things like that, and then, but they're expressed in a humorous way, so they don't become offensive. But really, at the end of it all, yeah, I'm, I don't want... Actually, if I'm dealing with four-year-olds, the four-year-olds, they have to get used to me. If, if we start talking about four-year-olds, we're in a whole different space, right? If we start talking about four-year-olds, we have the challenge just to keep them engaged. So we've been talking about a four-year-old program. You know, remember, four-year-olds haven't sat in the classroom yet. I don't know if you've, understood, if you've seen a lot of the recent stuff on preschools, preschool education, but uh, 2,000 children were expelled from pre, no, 8,000 children were expelled from preschool last year in the USA. <laughs> expelled from preschool. <laughs> because preschools were starting to get kids to, they require kids to sit down, listen, and work at a table like they do at elementary school. They are not designed to do that. Most of those kids that got expelled were African American boys. Those kids, I mean, they they play in a very active way. Those boys, they're not designed to sit down in a classroom like that. Right? So sorry, sorry, low income, sorry, low income African American boys. Yeah. So it's very interesting that if you're dealing with preschools, I, I said we were talking about this earlier. We have the tennis whiz program, which that racket is from. The balls from it's 40 stories. Every story is like we're going to the we're going to space, we're going to the beach, we're going here, we're going there. The activities you tell it like a story. You know, there's a preschool activity sheet. It's a completely different format than if you're teaching five to six year olds who started elementary school, because it goes back to what we we're talking about before. You're dealing with a kid for a few hours a week. You have to make that work with the, what's going on the whole of the rest of their life. A four-year-old isn't conditioned to take instructions like that. A four-year-old is designed to go and explore their environment, pick up things, stick things in their mouths, yeah? do all kinds of weird and wonderful things. You engage them by telling them a story. A six-year-old is a very different animal. They've been in elementary school for a year and a bit. They've been conditioned by elementary school. So you start getting into skills, you have to get into kids as well. All right, so well, based on what we've done, we've set our environment that every environment needs to have a space, two players, and some movement. Even if those two players are like one's receiving, like Marley just did, one's hitting, and even if I'm involved by feeding or not feeding, that's a bit of a, a misconception. But now we have to start looking at what are those skills. So we have to get into what are the basics of key rally skills that every kid needs to teach. Now every single one of these activities, every kid needs to learn. Every single one of these activities I'm going to deliver, we would probably deliver for five minutes. Then we would stop, five to ten minutes, stop, go do another activity, then come back for five to ten minutes, 
then go off to another activity and come back for five to ten minutes. So the whole lesson ends up being little blocks of time rather than this is this week it's the forehand. That's the other thing that they're not designed to do. Okay? So we're going to start with just little reception activities, real simple. Um, just because these are the ones that we're not used to doing. Now, I've seen some of these on videos, on USTA videos. And other. They miss some of the key principles we said before. For example, I don't see them define the space very well. The space drives the skill, remember. If you're playing a little space, you're going to make a little shot. Playing a big space, you're going to make a long shot. So, um, we'll start with. What's that everyone down the same thing? We're all going down here. So, we're getting right back to these little kids who really can't play them, yeah? Get past them. Okay, so we're going to have to put it around over there by the basket. Okay, so if we start right at the beginning, what does a kid need to be able to learn to do in order to establish even a basic rally so that they can start working towards the throwing game to be started right at the start? Okay, so they need to catch a ball, right? What's involved in catching a ball? Focus, movement, concentration, tracking. We start to talk. We, they're skills we talk about, they're not skills we always grind down to. Do you know, for example, there are four stages to catching? Stage one. Yeah, completely non-reactive. The kid literally looks at their hands at the end and goes, why isn't the ball there? Yeah, okay. Stage two, because this is about growth and development, we call the sea lion. Yeah. They actually use their shoulders to try and catch the ball. No? Stage three, we call the hug. Yeah. Stage four, we call the grab. So that's just the way a kid grows. First of all, they, they brought their, their, their whole mechanics, they, they haven't got the right stimulus to initiate the movement at all. Then they use the big bits of their body to try and catch. Just like when they run when they're little, they do it like that. Then they gradually add another bit, elbows, and gradually add another bit, wrists. This is the way we develop. You think about someone learning forehand. And they gradually get the elbow involved, and then if they're very, very, very good, they can get the wrist involved. But if you go the other way around, you start with the wrist, day one. It's like, you know, they Harry Potter with his wand for them to say, it's like, this is the ball that's going absolutely everywhere. So this is the process by which we go. But what we're going to try and do is we're going to deal with the trapping of the ball. So what are the ball characteristics which we have? The characteristics of a ball in flight. If I said one of them is height. Depth. Okay, speed. So we'll come back to class one in a minute. Yeah. Spin. Spin. One more. Direction. Direction. And then pass one was depth. Now, That's depth one is, is the true characteristic. It says depth, one, depth is always determined by the others. Okay. But it's very true. It's the one that they challenge, they struggle with the most. You will see Lana throwing your ball. You'll see kids, for example, do this. Yeah? They'll run to where the ball's bouncing because they haven't assessed the ball properly. So we need to just start them off by helping them to work on flights of the ball. So tennis, we normally have two flights of ball, one, two. Correct? So all we're going to do is a little clap game. So all you have to do, last step of the side, when the ball lands on the ground, you have to clap exactly when it lands on the ground. Now that's because kids find it very easy to identify key physical things. Black, white. The most physical thing you can see in this game is when the ball strikes the ground. What's the other easy point to identify physically? When it hits the hands. Yeah, yeah either when they catch the ball or when it leaves the line. So we're going to do, we're going to do underhand right side like that. So when it leaves my hand, we're going to clap. Right? Just leave my hand ready. There you go. Yes. 
<laughs> At least you're honest. Right. Okay. So the key thing here is put your hand up if you've ever said watch the ball. Yeah, okay. But this is watching the ball. Right? This is watching the ball. That doesn't necessarily mean that they identified something. That's not what you meant. You meant identify something going on with the flight of the ball. Right? And so that's really important. So let's just have a real quick go. Let's see if you can work together. Press them down.
right? Now, I have no concept of space. So the only thing that I can see at the other end of the court, and it's wearing pink as well, <laughs> so I'm definitely seeing it big time, is Elana. So I try now to throw the ball at Elana, basically. That was a good catch. Try and hit your feet. Because she's the physical thing I see. I don't calculate, okay, the ball must land before that little yellow line there in order to get there. So most people don't define this well enough. And then they go, the kids can't do it. The other thing that they struggle with is the fact that most child learning is like baking a cake. Where the hell is he going with this one? Right? You mix it up, you stick it in the tin. I'm an experienced cake baker. Right? You mix it up, you stick it in the tin, you put it in the oven. You look through the oven door for the first 20 minutes. What does it look like? It looks like nothing's happening. All right, and then all of a sudden it rises and it rounds and they go, oh, look, it happened. It was always happening. It just hadn't manifested itself yet. We hadn't got to the finish line. So people are trying to make this happen like in five minutes. It's not designed to happen in five minutes. You've got to do it for five minutes, go off and do something else, come back to it for five minutes, go off and do something else, come back on another lesson for it for five minutes, and then after a while, the cake will bake. But when it looks like a mess to start with, it's fine. It, it, you are actually learning. As long as you've set the environment up right, have the point of the ball supposed to land. So on, on the sheet it says, where from, where to, and how. Yeah? Those are the really important things. Where from, where to, and how. That has to be defined in every environment. If it's not, of course the kid's going to throw the ball at the head say throw the ball to her. They haven't calculated the distance or the space or any of those things. They can only see physical things. Right? The other thing you might have is you might actually have to teach them to throw. Don't assume that they can throw. That's where like the preschool program, we know from doing the preschool program when those kids come out of it, they're all they can all run and jump and throw and catch and now it's easy to teach them tennis. A lot of the kids haven't. They've been sat in front of the TV watching 27 episodes in a row of Dora the Explorer. They can sing the song Barmanos very well, and we did it, we did it, but actually, they can't move. Right? So when the kids throw it, you might have to teach them which foot's in front of the other one, where your hand has to point to the other one. My favourite is throw it to a particular end. Alright? Or point at the end, whatever you want to do. Not with your middle finger, okay? That's what some kids do. Right, okay. So, this is the environment. This is how it's set up. Yeah? So I'll just try it for a little bit. See the but it's still not going to be pretty. Oh, that's a big sub. My girlfriend's working on me. I still can't get it. Just got a shrimp and grits. I can't pass anything else. Right? Okay. So, it won't look like this, will it? No. What's going to be the variable? The big variable is now going to be... Yeah, no, in terms of the ball flight. The height. Height, which will contribute to what? Okay, do you see this happening here? Do you see this happening? Yes, You see the kid running to where the ball bounces, and a lot of the time getting too close. That's because, not because they can't judge depth. They can judge depth, but only over one flight. Yeah? So the first flight of the ball is, there to there. I did judge that. How do you know I judged it? I ran right to it. Yeah? So actually you're going to see a lot of that kind of thing. So we need to learn to make space between us and the bounce. So that's where we use these things. So, so a lot of times when you tell the kid to toss the ball, they don't have any concept of this, they do that. Yeah. Well, that's because an overarm throw is the first throw a child learns. People forget that. People all think that underarm is easier than overarm. But if, believe me, if you've been a parent, you know this. The kid picks the thing up and they go like that. They do this throw. Right? They learn that one first. This is actually harder. Okay? I should find boys throw this way and girls throw that way. Why do you keep throwing that way? Right? 
because I'm not three. <laughs> okay. But actually, learn, teaching them to toss is very important. So, okay, now we have a cone. Okay, and you're going to use it to catch the ball. Alright, so the idea is you catch the ball in the cone. And the reason you do that, and it's been on loads of videos, but I never really see it explained, is because you have to catch the ball to stay away from the first bounce. You can't catch the ball on, its, on the rise in a cone. So it doesn't matter if it's a baseball cap or if it's in a cone or how you do it. And look, I've presented this drill maybe a hundred times. I still don't see people doing it very well. Because you've got to understand what you're trying to do. Where would you like them to catch it? Okay, to start with, they're going to catch here because that's natural for anything coming towards you to get your body behind it. Where would you like them to catch it though? So you'd like them to catch it over here on the contact point. Mm -hmm. So you're going to try it once. But there's a pro progression. So naturally, the first person's going to catch it here. And then after a period of time, you want to try and catch it here. Okay? Let's see if we see how we can see if I can make these even better. See if we look at some little teaching points. Okay, go. For a good ready condition before we start. Ready condition, as you know, ready condition, what part of the body do you look at? What part of the body do you look at to see a good ready condition? Notice I didn't say ready position. They're deep. They're bent down a little bit. Ready condition is told when you're looking at someone's eyes. Mm -hmm. Okay? Before you throw the ball, kids, make sure that other person's looking. That's good, right? Hold on, right? Because you can have kids like this. <laughs> yeah, they're standing the right way. The seagull flies over there. <laughs> right, it's all here. Right. Okay, so let's see if we can move the contact point now a little bit to the side. That's a bit more all over. Okay. Alright? Not using the racket at all. That doesn't matter. They think 
you don't play tennis because you've got a racket in your hand. <laughs> <laughs> it's more like soccer, really. So don't worry about it. Alright? Okay? But what we're doing, so what you're going to do is, because Rene was stopping the ball like this, with his foot in front, I want him to let the ball come in here, control it, and then slide it back. So we will find out if Americans can play soccer at this point. Let's give it a go. So you're going to roll it, smiley, come back here, break your roll. Okay? Outside foot and slide it back. That's good. Now you can move it, you can catch only one of your rolls and one of your kicks. Okay? So don't move it usually. Break the catch it, roll it. Right, we'll talk it over in a minute. Yeah. Yeah. Now, this is a fundamental. Yeah. A lot of people talk about stances in tennis. Stances are all about facilitating balance. Right? So I grew up playing tennis from the time when everyone started talking about open stance. And I didn't call it open stance, I called it the age of the crap. Because you literally had these kids that have been told by their coach, they must be open stance the whole time, they'd be going. Okay. Yeah? And then they get short ball and they go. Right like that. That is not what you're doing. What you're trying to do, balance at the start of any action is is about is on your outside foot. So on any single what you're looking for, all the best players in the world, they get into a position where this foot is behind the ball. Getting to this so I am now balanced. I'm balanced at the start of the action. Okay? I'm not necessarily balanced at the end of the action yet, because this foot has to then go where my balance is going to finish. So if I'm going to, if I'm just going to make a very simple little swing like this, then my foot needs to be there. Yeah. If I'm going to totally rip it, my foot probably needs to be over there, because that's where my balance foot's going to end. So everyone categorizes these stances like some kind of, you know, thing in a box, but really it's simple. That foot has to be behind the ball at the start. This foot has to be where my, ba my, bounce, my weight, body weight is going to finish, otherwise it'll fall over. It's not a good thing in tennis, generally. Okay? So if I'm going forwards, that's fine. If I'm making a little swing, these kids are going to be really little, they're going to make a little swing like that. All they need is that. Look, there's the start, there's the end. So I've seen, like, I watched one preschool program where they insisted everyone started open starts with a western grip. And I, when I asked why, they told me, like one of the key coaches in the world said this was the way to hit a forehand. And I'm going, mm. you know, how stupid is this person? Right? If, you know, it's, it's, it's about making, helping your, if it's about skill, it's about helping your body to do things. It's not about saying this is a forehand. Okay, so you see this drill here, just do it for a few more minutes, right, a few more seconds. He's about trying to get that foot behind the ball. Okay, now let's bring this up to a really interesting thing. What's your expectation of how many times they're going to get it right? Yeah, I'll tell you a little story about a group of four-year-olds in Pennsylvania about two years ago. I was doing this thing, and there were four-year-olds, and the coach had asked them to rally to five. And they were quite able, these little kids, they were quite good. And after a few minutes, they'd rally to two and three, but never got past that. And the coach said, let's stop and try something else. And I said, hold on, let's ask them. And when I went across, I said to this little boy, what do you think about this game? Do you want to change it? And he said, no, it's okay, coach. I haven't finished trying yet. <laughs> Tells you a lot about our perceptions and their perceptions. Kids who are starting something expect to fail, expect not to be brilliant at it to them. So it depends how you set it up. If you set up this drill with, right, this is what I want you to do, yeah, with the expectation of everybody doing it, but if you set it up with, right, the game we're going to do today is really difficult. It's really tricky. I don't think anybody's going to be able to do it like more than once. In fact, the world record for kids on their first day of training is, is two. So if you can do it perfectly more than two times, you are already a world record holder. It's the same game, but the way you set it up determines the expectation of what you're going to get. So often we want kids to come in and we want the cake to be baked within the first five minutes. And it's not going to happen because it doesn't happen in anything. But what you've got to make it is it's happy for them to put themselves on the edge and fall over a few times. Yeah. We're happy for them to fail. That's part of learning. All right? So this game might help me with the previous game. Can everybody see that? Yeah? There are a whole load of other versions of this game we can try as well. Renee, just go to the other end for me. 
Uh, Ilan, just go down there for, for a second. So, uh, you, you, you can throw me ball during the kick. Right, now I'm just going to let the ball bounce twice and bump it. That's all. Ball bounce twice and hit it. Right, because all that's teaching me to do is move away from that point I kept running madly towards that first bounce. See that? Yeah? You're going to run before.
They mm -hmm. teach tennis like the ball was still. Like, oh, it's easy. You know, there it is, just do this swing. Well, guess what? I call, I call this the five minute forehand. Because for most kids, you can teach it in five minutes. That does not mean you've taught them to play tennis. Because the ball doesn't do that, it does that. And that's the hardest thing. And after this one, I would say, it doesn't matter if you're teaching under 10s, high school, or adults. If you don't have these skills, you would not be able to play tennis. That's really, really important for us to understand. Okay? All right, so look, these skills go all the way, all the way through, 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 through to the point where that we do things with the orange and green kids, like if we're feeding, this is not something from today to learn this one, yeah? If we're feeding, if I'm gonna feed a deep ball, I'll feed like that. If I'm gonna feed a short ball, I'll feed like that. I suck. <laughs> feed like that, it's better. Okay, if I'm going to go down the line, I'll feel like this. If I'm going to go cross court, I'll feel like this. And then the kids learn to watch their opponent without even realizing it. When in what I call the back of the brain, they soaked it up. And we call that in tennis what? Anticipation. Anticipation. Someone said anticipation. We call that anticipation. It's not a mysterious magical cloud above the, air, above the sky. It's you put them in the environment where these things were there and they learn them. They don't have to always learn things deliberately and in uh, strings, you know, they can often learn things implicitly and do things very well. So if you think reception skills stops at catching the cone or moving forwards or backwards or this one, you do this one. One and two. Yeah? Kids 
that come with, you know, to a certain extent, every kid comes like this bottle of water, right? But they're, they're full to a different degree. So if the bottle of water came like that, yeah, you find it easy to teach them. Okay, if the bottle of water came like that, you've got a lot more work to do. It doesn't necessarily mean that this kid, because he came like that, as we all know, the kid that comes like that that doesn't top the bottle up is your biggest regret in life. Yeah? The kid that's enthusiastic and motivated wants to get the, the, the cap off real fast and get the water in. So, in terms of how we don't teach the, the skills that are really required, simple really. Yeah? Alright, so um, that's the reception part of it. Now I need to start thinking about the projection part of it. Okay, so now you're in the right place. What is it a kid really needs to be able to do to work with that racket effectively? And how do we go about delivering those things? So, um, if I start with if I start with what we really need to know, bare bones, I'll tell you what I tell the school teachers. Right? Wherever the strings point, that's where the ball goes. If you need to go a long way, make a big swing. If you don't need it to go very far, make a little swing. And they go, oh yeah, but what about backhand? And you go, wherever the strings point, well, that's where the ball goes. If you want it to go a long way, make a big swing. If you don't want it to go very far, make a little swing. Well, what about sir? Ah, wherever the strings point, that's where the ball goes. And if you want it to go a long way, make a big swing. And if you don't want it to go very far, make a little swing. Now, there are certain key things, obviously, within that. It's not as simple as that, but basically, that is sense. If you're in the right place, yeah, and you can get to, the, you're, you're trying to get to the right contact point, a lot of your work will have already been done. So, you know, I see lots of lessons where people are teaching the mechanics of the forehand to the nth degree, but the person doesn't have reception skills. So they're never going to be in the right place to use that forehand. Now, how do we want to start with kids with a racket? Well, first of all, we want to talk about the racket face more than the grip. Most people get sucked into the grip concept. The grip is important because the grip facilitates the racket face in the right position. But more than anything, you're saying, okay, that's where I want to impact the ball. Yeah? Now, you can drive that with a little grip. So, the grip goes to the other end. If I want to rally from here, it helps if I've got a ball. If I want to rally from here, over this distance, the environment forces me to have a certain contact point if I'm going to be successful. In other words, the good kids will have a contact point that's between them and the net. That's how we just did it. It isn't silly enough to have a man with a hand in his pocket. <laughs> to open the door and say to the coach, come help me. 
rather than you sometimes feel like you're trying to teach and basically you're standing on the other side of the door and the kids go, nah, 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 I don't want to change. So this environment here should help me to use my contact points in the right way. But if it doesn't and I'm unsuccessful, now the coach has a job. As long as there was some kind of points or some kind of scoring system to the drill. Do you get that? There has to be a motivation. If there's no motivation to change, I can be as unsuccessful as I like. Right? But if I fail a little bit, that's a good thing, because that makes the kid want to open the door and ask you in. So what we're looking for is, we're looking for a kid to have their act in this position, make their impact point in front. And then the swing must fit how far the ball goes. So if you now tell me that this is a forehand, and this is the only forehand, right, we have a problem. Uh, equally on the backhand, right? That's your backhand impact point, or that's your backhand impact point. You can teach a lot of one-handed backhands if you wish to. It does not all have to be two-handed. If you use the right racket and the right ball, it is possible. Okay? Um, that said, I did say this morning that kids learn by kids learn by repetition or by differences. Or by differences. Let me explain how that would work. So we're going to try and go around into four. You can do one, two, three, and four. And after doing that, we've just done a very little swing. How can we do a big swing? Back. So now we're going to come back to here. And we're going to try and do one, two, three. Now maybe we're not doing that yet, but a messy four. Where are we going to go now? Sometimes when, sometimes when Rene's trying to learn, right, his brain isn't taking on board the information correctly. What he actually needs to do is shove a pencil in the side of his head and rattle the cogs around a little bit to loosen things up a bit. And that's kind of what this does. This stimulates all the neurons in your brain to really start adaptation. Learning is a process of adaptation. Right? This is called differential learning. If you want to look it up online, you'll find out why it works, and everyone in motor learning knows about it, except tennis people. Truth. Right? It's been around for 50 years. Loads of other sports and organizations have used it to, to increase skill development. But in tennis we go, no, repeat, 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 repeat. Tell me anything a little kid does, repeat, 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 repeat. Nothing. Alright, so all we've got here, and obviously if you move back here, it's going to get the mechanics right, you're also looking for things like you want to start getting a little turn. Alright, which you don't necessarily need when you're working up here. swings and big swings. Hit it over there, hit it over there. So if you want to learn direction, don't just hit the ball to one place, learn to hit four balls over there, four balls over there, four balls over there, four balls over there. And the kid's brain is going to learn to adapt where the racket face is to make the direction work. You can also use differential learning, for example, um, as, a, as rather than opposites, you can use it like a bit of a flower. Like you have one thing you're going to teach, and you approach it from all different angles. Oops. Well, that's the thing we're going to teach in the middle, and I just try five different drills that will help me learn it. So, for example, if I'm going to learn to control the racket face, it might be that I've got it right over there, right over there, right over there. Now, it might 
just be that we're going to keep it real basic and really early stage stuff. So
Now the last few strategies that are on the bottom of your handout in terms of teaching are, one of the ones I use now, which I've found quite really a lot of fun, is I'll, I will put three teaching points down on the, on the call. Okay, okay. Um, do you think, Brett, you need to work on your contact point, work on your balance, or work on a little bit more of a low to high swing? You choose. He goes over and he picks up the card of the one that he thinks he wants to work on. Does he always go bright? No. Is he motivated to work on it though? Yeah, because he chose it. So I don't give him an infinite menu, I just give him three things and say, right, you want to choose one? So that's another thing, go away and try. Right? It's really quite interesting where you give the kids the choice of the teaching point, you set up the practice and you say, which one would you like to work on? From this one, this one, or this one. Of course you always know, it's like that game, um, you know the game, think of a number between one and nine. Have you ever done that game? Yeah? Okay, just try it everyone now. Think of a number between one and nine. Multiply it by nine. Yeah? Add the two digits of the number together. Okay? Yeah, you got your number? Okay, take away five. All right? Give your number a letter. So if it's one, it's A. If it's two, it's B. If it's three, it's C. Four is D. Five is E. Six is F, like that, yeah? Okay? Um, think of a, I tell you what, I'm a European, so think of a European country beginning with that letter. Go on. Okay. Take the second letter of that country and think of a four-legged animal. Second letter of that country, think of a four-legged animal. Okay. So, your elephant, is it African or Indian? Is it right? Now, if you did your maths right, you would all end up with E. And unless you're a Canadian, you would have thought elephant rather than elk. Right? Um, it's very simple. In other words, it's just a series of questions. There's only so many answers you can have to the question, and they will lead you to a certain point. And that's the same as what you're doing with all your teaching. If you do ask questions, you have to know the answer before you ask the question. Think of a number between one and nine, multiply it by nine, and add two digits together. Everybody has nine, yeah. if you did your maths right. Take away five, now everyone's got four. There's only one European country beginning with D, and that's Denmark. And even if you chose Deutschland, because you thought you'd be a bit flash and you would do a German derivative, the second letter is still E. And if you ask people to think before they get animal beginning with E, they think of elephant. Right? It's like think of an orange vegetable. Right? It's as simple as that. Okay? It's 90% of the wood is carrot. But the, my point being that even when I'm teaching technically, I can, I can lay down, it's going to be, I know it's going to be this teaching point, this teaching point, this teaching point. Most of the time on Red Lessons, I spend my whole time working on getting in the right place, getting on balance with my outside foot, and getting to my impact point. If I get those three fundamentals right, everything else gets done. There are 27,000 different things you need to teach in Red. If you teach those three things, and they understand the concept of the game which we started with, you can make a good little tennis player. It's easy. If you get lost in the woods, because you try to teach too many things, or you try to build the house too fast, you build a house of straw instead, because you're wanting to learn topspin on lesson one, don't be surprised when your kids can't actually rally, and they don't have the foundations or the fundamentals that you need to go for. Okay. Um, I've spoken for a long time, so let's have any questions, and then we'll wrap up the day and people all on the road. What is your optimal Okay, six to seven kids, I reckon any coach should be able to handle six, no problem. And um, the good coaches can handle eight. The better the kid is, the more they'll be able to do with each other, and therefore the less it, the less you'll have to do. So a lot of Red Bull coaching is coaching like college coaching. Teach by walking around. Yeah, so if you think about that, how you really got to judge. So if you start with a red one class who really can't rally, I might have a six to one ratio. By the time we get to red three, they can really play. I might I can handle eight to one here, no problem. Alright? So I'm not but I'm not going past that kind that kind of number really. But a lot of people do go the other way around. They go, they start with a ten, you know, they start with a higher number and they try and work it down to like a lower number. 
But in Red Bull, I'm, I always start with a lower number, yeah, get them up and working really fast, and then and, and nine times out of ten, if we can, we, we ask them to come twice a week, at least for the first 12 weeks. Which again is the opposite way around to what most people do. Most people say, oh, I want to come once a week, and you go, if you want to come once a week, you're not going to get it for good very fast. Can you just come twice a week for the first six weeks, or the first 12 weeks, or whatever, then we can get you up there, and then you can choose whether you want to carry on doing more or not. Right? Most people do it the other way around, they go, the better you get, the more you're going to come, which of course will happen as well. By then you're motivated to come to talk. Okay? Other questions? A long two days. Good, really good question. Right. What do you ask? We, he asked the question, how often do we take a drill and turn it into a competition? We've been playing around with this one thing recently. When do you normally play points in a lesson? Yeah. Right. What did I say was the most important thing right at the start of this whole problem? Or process? Motivation. What is not as important as why? So the context gives the why. Context for a lot of the time is playing points. So, especially with little boy groups, we've started doing drill, points, drill, points, drill, points, drill, points. And the drill is like a competitive version of the cooperative. So, we do a drill, then straight to the competition using that skill. Right now, we're going to play points with that skill. And they, they get into the mindset that they know every time we do a practice. They're going to be playing points with that practice in five minutes. So they then commit much faster to, because we've created the reason in their head. They know they're going to need that skill to win points in five minutes. Not always the way if we have a little girls group, because the little girls generally don't need it. But if we have the mixed groups as well, we'll also do that. We'll also have drill points, drill points, drill points, rather than drill, 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 drill points. Seems to work better. Okay. Anything else? So with the skills you were doing there earlier with the four hands, you could be doing that in back hand and you know some good. Now we're not making any grips, but you did notice it in the one hand back hand and then you could grip. Is that the end of the world? No, it's not the end of the world, but but if you go back to racket base control, you know, there are a lot of nations in the world that never mention grips. Right? They don't mention grips at all. They talk about racket base control and impact. Right? So if I say I want the racket face to look like that, it's way harder to do that if I have a continental grip. If I can do that with a continental grip, then who are you to tell me not to? So in other words, the, one of the, I have to create a reason to change. But now we encourage, we still encourage a little grip change. Sometimes I might go right, try this for a bit. Is that easier than this? Right. The other thing we'll do is just like if you had an advanced player at a full western try to get them to change, all you do is you slice balls to their forehand the whole time. And after dumping 12 balls in the bottom of the net, you go, just let me know if you want me to help you. <laughs> slice you another one, slice you another one. So it's, it's a question of, you know, fundamentally as human beings we only change if we need to change. I, a good example of that is I have nine Spanish CDs in the back of my car, learn Spanish with Michelle Thomas, who happens to be French. So I'm not really sure <laughs> I'm learning Spanish with a French man. Right? But now they've been there for ages and ages and ages and ages, and I really didn't engage in it until they said to me, the ITF said, Mike, can you go to Argentina, Colombia, and Bolivia? And I went, where are those CDs? <laughs> okay? I always wanted to learn Spanish, but I didn't really engage until I had a need to change. And if you've ever been to Bolivia, no one speaks English. If you say, no habla espanol, everybody laughs in your face. Right? So it's not like you go to Mexico, you're all right. all right. It's not Cancun, you know, the other state of the US, basically. Okay? All right, anything else? All right, um, I can give you 100 games if you like. They won't make you a better tennis player. If you do the fundamental things really well, if you focus down on this is what we need to do, you know, we need to receive the ball well, we need to be on balance, we need a good impact ball. Okay? And you really focus on that, can make kids better faster. Um, the other message I will say is I teach so much technique at red level. So much technique at red level. But all
always with a reason. Yeah, always like, okay, oh, we can't get the ball there. Oh, do you want me to help you? Oh, why don't you try this? And that's where you do your technical interventions. What we don't do, and this is a big message that's been missed, is we don't start with technique. Because if you start with technique, it's boring as hell. Because you don't understand why you need it. But if you do a technical intervention, in other words, the person can't achieve something, so then you teach them the technique to help them achieve that skill you're trying to get to happen, then they'll stop and listen forever. Right? Because if they want to do it. So that's a real big misconception as well. People think you don't get into technical stuff with little kids. You really do get into technical stuff with little kids a lot. Because if you get that bit right, the rest of it flows. If you do a great job in red, you get some awesome orange kids they start adapting all by themselves. But it, it's a big misconception. But that, you need to understand how it's done. We set up a situation where you need that technique. Then, when the kid can't do it, you step in and you provide the answer. It's a very different way than just, this is a forehand, kids. Yeah? Uh, otherwise, it's like, you know, giving a Ferrari to a caveman. He's probably going to live in it. He's certainly not going to drive it. And if he does drive it, he's going to crash it. Right? And that's what, like, just starting with technique is. It's like, you know, you need to understand why do I need to drive fast? Okay, that's why I might. All right, can I say um, some thank yous then? Thank you very much for. Uh, same girlfriend I have now. Both of those two may not happen if I don't make it happen fast. <laughs> right. um, 